Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Parag Khanna, who directs the Global Governance Initiative at the New America Foundation. His new book is How to Run the World, Charting a Course to the New Renaissance. Parag, welcome uh, back to Berkeley. Thank you. Thanks, Harry. Uh, how long did it take you to write this book? Well, this one's been in the works for about a decade. This was meant to be my first book, but my publisher was more captured by my kind of traveling geopolitical romp that was that became the Second World. Only after that book, uh, you know, was successful enough did they say, "Okay, now you can do what you want." And I said, "Well, actually, there is this idea that you didn't like before, but it it was worth the wait because this also was um, derived from my PhD, which was only finished uh, in the last couple of years. So I was able to bring in a lot of that material as well. So it's in the thought as a thought." process that's been in the works for a long time, but formally writing it the last last two to three years. And, and it, let's remind our audience about the first book. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was really kind of a global tour of, of the, the emerging uh, uh, BRICS yeah. at, at that time. Well, BRICS plus 40, because it was really 45 countries that I traveled through for about two and a half years. And, uh, you know, I think uh, events, uh, recent events, particularly in the Middle East, have really vindicated, you know, um, my the fact that I spent a lot of time immersed in traveling in Libya, in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia, in Jordan, and Syria, and so forth, because I felt each of them was important in their own way. Each of them will have a different trajectory now going forward. I wrote about how Egypt was ripe for revolution, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, many of the places that we'll see in the next few years, capturing headlines, whether it's Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan or Colombia or Indonesia. There are chapters in that book on every one of them, one by one by one, that I spent time traveling. And I think, you know, the importance of these emerging park, emerging markets, emerging powers, was really what that book was about. And, and uh, how do you account uh, for your ability to uh, do such a, a global view of places uh, and now in this book of the global system, is it a is it the interface between your hat as an academic and your hat as a journalist? Well, you know, I don't wear a journalist hat at all. I wear a traveler hat, you know, mm -hmm. and I would say I, I, it's more traveler clothes. I mean, I was sort of, that's my skin. Uh, I've been traveling my whole life. That's my original methodology. Uh, the academia is, is grafted on top of that rather than the reverse. And I think for some academics, it's a little bit of travel that gets added on to academic work. For me, it's some balance of the two, but it's, it's, it's I think, you know, however I go about it, it's my own sort of way. But the real continuity between these two books is that that was about structural change, the shift from unipolarity to multipolarity, and, the, and this is about systems change, the change from a world of just state units to a world of state and non-state actors coexisting. And so that's, that's why I see these two as really logically flowing from one another. And systems change, as you know, is a much deeper phenomenon than structural change. So here I am, it's a shorter book, but it's one that is actually tackling a much bigger problem. And, and when you say, uh Structural change versus system change. Explain the difference there. Well, structural change is, again, the shift in the number of poles of power, but within, without changing the nature of the unit. So you're still dealing with states or empires. And so in Second World, the shift from the U.S. as a, as a hegemonic, you know, in a unipolar world to a multipolar world, China, the European Union, and others. But here now, when you talk about private authority, corporations, NGOs, terrorist groups, again, uh, cities in particular, so state-like units, but also non-state actors, coexisting in the same global system with a complex dynamic, that represents a systems change which, um, you know, as this book uh, tries to argue, is, is uh, characteristic of the Middle Ages period of a thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, let's talk about that, that uh, uh, comparison with the Middle Ages. What was that world like and then what, what do you see in this world that is very comparable? And, you know, the, so the world of a, of a millennium ago really was you know, quite similar in the sense that there was structural multipolarity. Song Dynasty China was the most advanced civilization. The Chola Empire of India was a great uh, naval power. Uh, the Arab Islamic Caliphates, uh, from Cairo to Baghdad, really reached from North Africa to Central Asia. Europe was weak and divided between the Holy Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire. So that Eurasia, the known world, was a multipolar landscape with none dom dominating entirely over the others. That is therefore a useful sort of you know background guide to today. But then comes the systems change. The fact is that that was a world 
in which you had a coexistence of religious authorities, such as churches, you had cities uh, and, and city authorities as such, as, as a primary unit, many thousands of political units at the time. But of course also mercenary armies, uh, universities, monasteries, and, and so forth, uh, wealthy families were all part of the overlapping and multi-level structure of governance uh, during that period of time. And that too, I think, is a really interesting reminder uh, or, or uh, you know, potentially a roadmap to understanding how the world kind of functions today in a post-national kind of world. Now, now one of uh, uh, the interesting questions become in, in, the, in this earlier period, what was the spark that, that led to the to the new Renaissance, right. and and or the old Renaissance. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, well, the the old it was new then yeah. at that time. Yeah. So so is it the development of of new uh, modalities of interaction and of new interests and so on? Well, there were several things. Uh, you know, and the Middle Ages was a very long period, and scholars dispute. I had to, to contend with this issue in in my dissertation. So scholars dispute to what extent the Renaissance was actually new versus the High Middle Ages based on certain political characteristics because freelance diplomacy was, and this is really a book about diplomacy, was continued to be uh, rife uh, across through the 15th, 16th, even 17th century. So it's hard to say exactly when the Renaissance began from a diplomatic standpoint. The codification of national foreign ministries such as in France really only occurred in the 17th century and beyond. So we're talking about a very long sweep, but technology obviously played a great role. The commercial revolution, printing press, the compass, gunpowder, or all of these things that led to a certain formalization of political processes. Of course, the expansion of global trade. Again, the, the, the voyages of exploration financed by European merchant houses had played a pivotal role in spreading ideas and creating something of a regular trade constellation across Eurasia. I call it Globalization 1.0. Globalization 1.0 is this pre-Renaissance kind of kind of situation. Today, I would say that we're at Globalization 5.0. Certainly, more global and more intense than ever before. But technology, uh, you know, is is really a key driver in that. And of course, we're seeing analogous technology shifts today. No wonder people compare the internet to the printing press and so forth. Let, let's dissect the this uh, uh, the dark side here of the present period. Right. Uh, what 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 do uh, help us understand what's going wrong right. before we talk about what is emerging? Quite a few things. I mean, you know, I will say that that the ambition of this book is nothing less than to turn our conception of the evolution of global governance on its head, and I'll tell you precisely why. We have believed that since the rise of what could be called global management structures from the Congress of uh, Vienna in the early 19th century after the Napoleonic Wars, through the League of Nations after World War I and the United Nations after World War II, that evolution, loosely defined, uh, for, in global governance is represented by an ever-increasing centralization of authority in international organizations and institutions that use a singular rule of law to, to govern international affairs. I believe the exact opposite, 180 degrees, again, on its head is what is truly happening. And that is because of globalization. Globalization, as you know, is a force that decentralizes, not centralizes authority. It dissipates power and empowers local far-flung units and actors. It does not centralize. So the, the motivations of most of the global governance field and community, both in academia and in the real political world, are really, quite frankly, the exact opposite of what is happening. And so my purpose or ambition is to sort of go with the flow. Say, what does decentralized global governance look like? Local governance, the sum of which becomes global governance. That's the approach that this book tries to take. And, and so let's, let's go down this path. of Does this help us understand why uh, as multipolarity emerges, as uh, the BRICs are a real presence, as American power, relative power is declining, that nothing is getting done because we're, we're focused on what governments can do, what the hegemon can do, what the uh, uh, meeting of the BRICs can do, right. and so on? I would say there, there's two things. I mean, the first is that, yes, the diffusion of power uh, towards rising powers enables 
uh, stronger regional systems to develop. So an East Asian sphere of influence in which China is becoming a more dominant figure, Latin America under Brazil, something in the Arab world under Saudi sort of uh, you know leadership. But the general trend towards regionalization, the African Union, the Union of South American Nations, this is a sign that we are diffusing power away from central hegemonic positions towards more regional constellations. So in that sense, it, it is part of the, the thesis. The second about collective problem solving being very weak is not only because great powers can't necessarily agree, such as the US and China on a whole raft of issues, but also that the collective resources represented by the world's governments and channeled through international organizations are quite meager to the task when it comes to climate change or uh, poverty alleviation or you know, meeting the security challenges, counterterrorism, pa piracy, proliferation, and so forth. It's simply not enough. And therefore, that's where systems change comes in. You have to bring in the resources of these new actors, philanthropists, corporations, NGOs, you name it. Where is their role in, in this postmodern diplomatic architecture? They don't have a role in the formal multilateral diplomacy of the 19th and 20th centuries. And there has not yet been the creation of a 21st century diplomacy that is multi-actor. And, and w one of the uh, important points that you're making is that on the one hand, we, we have fragmentation, uh, which leads to nothing happening at one level. If you use the, the, uh, the uh, concepts that focus on the state and international organization. But if you flip it, as you said, if you define things differently, then you, you see a beehive of activity where things are getting done. Absolutely, that's right. And hence, you have to look for results, not at the macro level. The measurement of success in implementing global security, uh, loosely defined, is not how many UN security resolutions were passed, really. It's how many regional peacekeeping interventions have actually taken place under the command of the African Union or, um, or uh, ASEAN or something like that. So you really switch or change the metrics that you're using and the, and the parameters and the geographies where you're looking for action towards that local level where you say what constitutes uh, you know poverty alleviation uh, in Africa what are the drivers of it is it really how much funding went from the World Bank or the IMF or the United or the United States government or is it the volume of remittances foreign direct investment things that are driven by citizens by companies and so forth and if you actually create a very formal analysis of uh, you know the volume of capital uh, that 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 is delivered to frontier markets, emerging markets, poor countries, the LDCs, the volume of uh, a foreign investment and remittances far outstrips anything that is provided by multilateral agencies and development agencies. So why is it that we have this government bias, so to speak, when it comes to a very specific thematic challenge? And to me, I organize this book and my thinking thematically because to understand what the governance mechanism or structure is on a given issue, you start with the issue, not with the institution and then you derive the right diplomatic structure from that. Mm -hmm. now, now, are you subverting our notion of governance? Because uh, it, it, at, at one level, you're explaining what's going on in the system. Mm -hmm. And then you're, uh, and further, you're explaining how the system works. But, but government uh, has evolved as the best manager in theory of uh, collective goods mm -hmm. and accountability. Well, I think we've moved well past that, quite frankly. What I'm doing is extending and celebrating the work that actually goes back well over a decade that speaks to governance without government or governance beyond government. And that is uh, really, again, you know, 10, 15 years, 20 years of literature. Uh, Wolfgang Reinecke, John Ruggie, and others that have said governance is the sum total or the intersection of public and private authorities that work in co cooperation, collaboration. There's a whole field emerging around collaborative governance. And to me, that is the model that we should be striving for in a world where very few, if any, uh, public institutions actually have the capacity to manage and provide the welfare, security, and so forth for their entire uh, populations domestically or transnationally. So this is really building on and, and, and championing the notion of governance as a multi-stakeholder phenomenon, which it absolutely empirically already is. It is for theory to catch up with practice. Right. Uh, I think we need to be very clear about that because 
this book is filled, you know, hundreds of pages of examples of governance happening as a multi-actor phenomenon, and very few examples, such as there are in fact very few, of government alone solving problems. And that applies even in very strong states. That applies even in the United States that requires so much corporate activity and investment to provide uh, certain elements of tr what are traditionally considered government sanctioned or, or provided welfare. That applies in the country of India, the second largest country in the entire world, which we think of as a strong state and a rising power, where so many public goods are provided by private actors. So if you look around the world, from security to welfare and other types of goods, you find truly that these are, are formed and delivered at the intersection of uh, multi-actor types of networks. Now, uh, what happens to the interests that are vested in the institutions uh, that uh, are still there and, and actually as they continue their practices uh, in, uh, in some areas can work against uh, the realization of this new sure. governance you're talking about. Um, adapt or die is, is the quick answer, mm -hmm. right? Because that is the whole history of institutional competition uh, throughout the world. I mean, you know, we, we tend to think that the UN, for example, will remain a central international governance mechanism just because it has been. Inertia dictates so much of our, of our thinking. That's simply not true. There is competition. Competition from the G20, competition from regional organizations, competition from public-private uh, partnerships, organizations, the Clinton Initiative, the World Economic Forum. I have chapters on those uh, actors and, and entities uh, in this book. And so competition is, is well underway in, in these different functional and, and thematic kinds of domains. So that, that's already happening. Um, yes, of course, state actors have the power to, again, to, to thwart this, but they're also heavily invested in participating in it. Um, you know, my, my approach doesn't stem from a utopian notion that all actors need to collaborate towards uh, a common understanding of collective ends or goods because that's just the natural order of things. I see an intense amount of debate and argument and hostility mm -hmm. in this. This approach emerges from a strong sense of suspicion. The suspicion is that governments don't in fact uh, universally um, hold as their top priority the provision of welfare and security for their people. Very often they don't. I don't think the regime of Libya can be characterized in that way, nor of dozens of other governments. A suspicion that, however, and, and also an observation that not all companies are strictly focused on uh, the bottom line and quarterly profits. One sees companies doing far more than that. And a suspicion that, that NGOs do more than just fill gaps. They, in fact, provide new models. So the, the fact that all of these actors have a right to justifiably actually be suspicious of each other falling short uh, of their expectations and a mutual monitoring mechanism that delivers a new kind of accountability is actually what I'm trying to get at. How, how do you account for the success of some theories, say in political science, in understanding what's going on, and and then but then the failure of others not to relate? What what makes the difference? Is it actually putting your ear to the ground and studying what's going on? Well, as you know, there's so much selection bias, you know, in in, in IR theory, uh, especially specifically when it comes to the sort of academic, uh, you know, theoretical debates and, and competition. At this point now, I fear that you know the field is very fragmented and, and everyone is defending their turf, whether they are uh, realists or constructivists and so forth. You know, my my own training uh, is is a bit derived from from the English school, the international society and world society approach that that does try and find a way to grasp the complexity of, of multi-actor kinds of diplomacy. So that's my personal bias. I do think that there is an inclusivity to that approach that other uh, approaches, particularly, you know, sort of structural realism, simply a priori shut out. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm sort of trained now also as a you know, a relatively recent addition to the scholarly uh, sort of field or profession. You know, I, I have a very contemporary view of these things. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when I read your book, one of the reaction that I had uh, uh, as a, a person, as a part of the general audience as opposed to, say, the audience of a political scientist right. was, well, at last, good news. <laughs> <laughs> because when, when uh, as you cover these different sectors, these different actors, uh, it, it's a very uh, different picture than the world we see every day on, on the nightly news. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, at this point, what I want to ask you before we go into right. detail on some of your arguments, uh, 
how does one go about changing the the media's perception of what's going on because it's a litany of bad news mm -hmm. whereas what you're showing is is there are a lot of interesting things going on because it strikes me that that uh, media perception is a dead weight right. on really uh, the realization of the the new renaissance well the media is definitely a double-edged sword you know on the one hand they are a reminder a constant reminder of how bad things are going in certain areas now they have their own motivations in projecting um, the world in that way and we shouldn't take the media picture of the world as representative of the entire reality right then they pick their slice of news and they cover that but the fact is the Haiti earthquake was really bad and NGOs on the ground in Haiti are really poorly coordinated along with the UN and the US and so forth so it is a very accurate de depiction of what I call the mosh pit of global governance and diplomacy today. It is a very accurate characterization. On the other hand, uh, you know, you could hear lots of bad news about Afghanistan, uh, and there is plenty of bad news there, and they're not telling the story of uh, NGOs uh, that provide schools and clinics and have, have elevated the literacy rate in the country uh, tremendously in the school enrollment rate and the health care rate and so forth. Uh, those good things you won't hear. But generally, I'm not considered actually an optimist, so I'm uh, most surprised <laughs> by uh, how you asked the question. But I'm, I'm hopeful because I see so many novel approaches, and I see the potential for those things. Take microcredit. Microcredit is not a phenomenon that came from a diktat from the World Bank or the United Nations. It was an experiment, a local small experiment in a far off corner of the world in Bangladesh. And now look, it's spread everywhere in the world, even the United States, every country in the world has it. Um, the international intergovernmental bodies and agencies such as we know them today are a very marginal peripheral player in that. They've jumped on the right bandwagon and support it in a variety of places. But it isn't theirs. It's owned by the people. And it has spread horizontally, laterally, through information sharing, through media as well, uh, through entrepreneurship. And I, and I celebrate the spread of those models, and I think that we can spread those models in any number of other areas as well. At, at one point in your book, early in the book, you say a, que a key question is, how much power do you have that is an actor and over what? Right. And so the, the question is, so you do have a sense of power, but is, is power related to efficacy? Getting things done? Is Absolutely. That well, legitimacy certainly derives today from efficacy, not just from legal authority. So the sovereignty of a government is not something that people necessarily respect, unless even a democratic government, unless it is seen to be delivering. Hence the credibility of the Chinese model and people calling into question uh, the Indian model, even though it's democratic. That's just one of quite a few examples one could cite where um, legitimacy and efficacy are tied together. The same is certainly true of power, the credibility of America and military power certainly is affected by the lack of efficacy in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places. So clearly we see that diminishing. What that relates to is obviously the notion that, that you know, different kinds of power have utility in different situations. Not every problem can be solved with the hammer of military power, as we well know. And yet there still is, again, inertia being such a governing force in, in, in our psychology. There still is a sense that certain actors are more powerful because they have latent military power, even when that power is not at all relevant in a certain context. So I, I strongly dispute the extent to which one can make uh, calculations of power without thinking about the context. And my goal here is to fuse those together as much as possible. Uh, a person who looks at government in the first instance might, might say, well, you have a Pollyannish view of the world because you don't take account, for example, of, of human greed, uh, of the, the capacity of individuals to displace goals and, and, and focus on getting ahead uh, uh, to the detriment you know, of the, the, the overall good. Talk about that. Oh, to the contrary. I mean, that's precisely my motivation, is the recognition that there is so many, there are so many more self-interested actors in this, uh, in this matrix today, and that, in fact, they have to have oversight over each other so much more than has been the case in the past. And the fear, motivated by the fear, that governments don't have the capacity to enforce uh, what we think of as a nominal sort of regulatory uh, environment over these private interests. So, in fact, that's deeply my concern, and I share that, 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 uh, that, that premise very strongly. What I'm trying to do is, to, is actually do something about it, not pretend that 
government capacity can magically improve or upgrade itself to the point where it is able to uh, clamp down on, regulate, monitor all these actors. What I'm projecting is a framework in which there is a mutual monitoring that goes on and some amount of enforcement that derives from those collective instruments. Because you can't really pretend that most of the world's governments have anything like the capacity of the United States or China or the United Kingdom or Germany. There are 200 countries in the world and a lot of this book deals with you know, the other 150 countries, right, which is most of the world, that quite simply don't have anything like that kind of capacity. What governs life in those spaces and states and places? It is not government. It needs to be absolutely clear to everyone who sits in, in Berkeley or in the United States, most of the world is not run like the United States. So one can't even speak of the state or the government at all anymore. So, you know, one operative concept here is post-colonial entropy. And again, we see this at play across Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia today. What are we seeing if not the fragmentation, the dissipation, the collapse, the crumbling of states that were, you know, artificial post-colonial constructions that over the last three decades where government capacity has not met the challenges of populations that have quadrupled in size, that have not invested in infrastructure, that have not planned adequately for succession. None of those things have happened. I don't consider these states to be on par with the state in the theoretical or Western sense of the term. They're not, and we should accept that. So, so it, it really, uh, again and again, this notion comes up in the book and in our conversation, getting beyond the weight of our concepts right. and institutions that are no, so the, co the colonialists divide up the world, draw boundaries that don't re respect the, 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 the different peoples right. that find themselves on, on both sides of the border. Well, you know, our, our maps don't capture things like the European Union, the single largest economic bloc in the world, despite its current, uh, you know, fiscal uh, problems. Um, we, it, it just doesn't capture that. It doesn't capture the private authorities that deliver the public services all across, uh, again, the entire post-colonial world. So maps are simply inadequate. Physical, territorial, political, ge political cartography is inadequate to capture those, those vectors of power and those actors. And that's not, uh, that's neither Pollyannish nor or too postmodern. That's a factual observation of, of life in, in the world today. I don't think that, uh, I think we do have to therefore move, move well beyond that. We have to be able to uh, visualize and represent things like uh, an emerging North American Union as an economic uh, bloc. Uh, of course, the Union of South American Nations as well, the African Union and, and European Union, as I mentioned. All of those things don't really show up on maps. We also have to be able to envision stateless groups uh, much better, right? I mean, South Sudan was just born, Kurdistan, Palestine, uh, Kosovo a couple of years ago, East Timor a decade ago. There, we're in the constant process of, of mutation uh, of the map to represent actually much more um, tangible on the ground realities. And I, I'm, I am out to capture those. And, and you actually uh, see the, the European Union as a model and, and you, you say it's not, it, it's, it's less about the union than the problem, the, than the process exactly. of Europeanization. Absolutely, Europeanization is perhaps the most important word that I, I can think of today to capture transnational governance uh, in a stronger and forcible regulatory environment, one that creates a borderless political space, a common economic union, but also is a force for very concrete and measurable political change, political and economic and social change in societies that are not members even of the union. So the 40, 50 year history of Turkey's relations with the EU, a large country that may never even join the EU. If you look at the changes, whether it comes to, uh, whether it is uh, women's rights, um, uh, political reform, economic reform, abolition of the death penalty, you name it, all of these things have happened largely due to European influence, even if that country never joins the EU. So Europeanization is more important than membership. That's just the icing on the cake. And, and you say in this, uh, as you're, you're laying out the new global architecture and the new global processes, you say the problem is implementing, evaluating, fixing, and spreading best practices. You need to load a new operating software onto our emerging global network. So it's process. Process is important. This book is called How to Run the World, not as a joke or as a throwaway <laughs> line. The word run is the important word. 
running, you run a business, you manage, it's a process. Diplomacy is a process mm -hmm. and a constantly unfolding process. It isn't a static thing. This is not a book about conquest. This is not a book about domination. This mm -hmm. is not called How to Rule the World. Running. And I wanted to step back and look at that process. And the common denominator is diplomacy and how diplomacy needs to be upgraded beyond a simple intergovernmental state-centric framework towards something that is much more multi-actor and multi-stakeholder. Let, let's explore that because diplomacy is something that emerges uh, in the old new renaissance. Mm -hmm. Talk about that and, and what it offered at that time and then where right. you're finding diplomacy today. Modern diplomacy emerged in the Renaissance. Diplomacy, as the joke goes, is the second oldest profession. It's been, <laughs> been with us for, for millennia. And diplomacy has always taken place among authorities, not sovereignties. Well before we had modern international law and state sovereignty, we still had diplomacy, in which the, a process of mutual recognition among authorities, so a church, a city, a corporation, a mercenary army, you name it, a university. Universities participated in what was called the right of legation in the Middle Ages. They were recognized actors in this way. So the number of authorities has proliferated wildly, millions of authorities. A corporation is a financial authority, right? A, a, a university is a knowledge authority. All are participating in diplomacy today, and it is diplomacy. It's not track to diplomacy. It's not an add-on to diplomacy. Mm. It's not secondary diplomacy. It is the real thing, very much so. It is intergovernmental, interstate diplomacy that is one slice, one third of what is mm. diplomacy today. The other two thirds are public-private relations, and the third third is private-private relations. Private authorities negotiate with each other. When uh, two corporations across borders form a merger, they have, they have conducted a diplomatic exercise that shapes the economies of the states in which they reside or choose not to reside because we know so many corporations can relocate their headquarters and so forth. When Walmart, the world's largest retail company, the equivalent of the 21st largest state economy in the world, decides to form a partnership with an NGO, the Environmental Defense Fund, to green its supply chain, which is perhaps one of the greatest contributions that will be made to climate change in the next 20 years, certainly more than any treaty that I can think of. That is a relationship between two private actors. That is private diplomacy taking place. So there are three kinds of diplomacy, and the modern interstate form of diplomacy is just one of those forms of diplomacy. And, and what, is, what is it, what are the skills uh, that uh, make uh, for successful diplomacy as diplomacy is uh, spread, decentralized, and found right. in all kinds of places that our conceptual models say, well, oh, that's not diplomacy. You're saying it is diplomacy. Absolutely. No, and, you know, the number of what are called postmodern diplomats, those who have careers that span the public and private sectors, uh, is really increasing. You find a number of people leaving government, joining the private sector, people from the private sector joining government, and so forth. So there's a lot of that going on. Now, the skill set. Um, the first is actually understanding process. And, you know, you said, how do issues get on the agenda? How are rules made? How is it decided what the policy will be? Who does the implementation, monitoring, and evaluation? That is the continuum of diplomacy and governance today. Knowing The skill set is knowing all of those steps along the chain and understanding how they work. And then the second skill is understanding it from the perspective of different authorities and groups. Knowing how a corporation looks at it, knowing how an NGO looks at it, knowing how a government looks at it, or how an intergovernmental organization or agency looks at it. So those are the kinds of skills. And of course, networking, forming networks among them and carrying through projects uh, you know, from start to finish. So that's, I think, the skill set that diplomats need today. Now that is, of course, very different from the 17th and 18th century of the mm -hmm. Renaissance description of the kinds of skills, language skills, patience, culinary skills, <laughs> um, you know, all of these things that have been written about for centuries as to, you know, what constitutes uh, uh, diplomatic acumen and tradecraft have changed a lot. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, interestingly enough, you, uh, you, you have uh, two uh, figures in your book when you're talking about diplomacy. And, and one profile that you did that really stood out was Jean Monnet. As a as a man ahead of his time, right. uh, who embodied 
uh, what what you see is happening today in an earlier period. Talk a little about him and so on. You know, not only was he a you know wealthy private citizen who um, you know was a financier of European railroads and industry, but then in the post Versailles period was uh, an important architect uh, of the League of Nations and supportive of the League of Nations uh, as a lobbyist among governance governments. Uh, then at the at, uh, later on in his career, took on the uh, the effort to recruit the United States into the World War II effort, and then eventually became really the architect of the modern European Union or its precursor with the coal and steel community. So he effortlessly, not well with great effort actually, but crossed public and private divides, uh, but always towards a certain collective purpose or a vision. So in that sense, I consider him, you know, a, a postmodern diplomat ahead of his times. The modern equivalents, people I write about a lot in this book, are you know the the George Soroses and Bill Gates and and whatnot of the world. Whom, if you think about it, who are the CEOs we admire the most today, it is these individuals who don't just think about the bottom line, even though that's all they technically have to do. They spend lots of time in the White House. They spend lots of time overseas. They have a certain sense of public purpose. They know that they are a private authority that commands resources, and they use those resources towards a universally recognized good. And therefore, they are respected as business people and as citizens and as contributors to global stability all at the same time. A CEO who wants to be respected in that way today needs to simultaneously be a statesman and think of themselves in that way. And that's what, that's what Jean Monnet did. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and another person you mentioned uh, who actually was a diplomat, and you, uh, Zalmay Khalazad, and you have a great quote for him, who, who is the ambassador in the age of the BlackBerry. And that's his, his own quote, yeah. Uh, he it, said that at the New America Foundation uh, at an event that, that we hosted for him. And I think that is very revealing, right? I mean, it, it, it speaks to the race between modern communications and diplomacy. And this book actually begins with tracing uh, or pointing to the number of times when people have declared the end of diplomacy or the death of diplomacy. When the first telegraph arrived at Whitehall in London in 1848, all the way through WikiLeaks, because what have we heard in the, with the WikiLeaks phone? It's the end of diplomacy, the death of diplomacy. Diplomacy never dies, mm. right? Diplomacy is, is present. It will always be there long after the state withers away or when there are some states and some non-states in a neo-medieval world. Diplomacy will always be there whenever we have interaction amongst these different authorities and communities. But diplomacy has to adapt to technology. And what Khalilzad is saying is, in this age of, of modern uh, high-speed communications technology, everyone with a BlackBerry can go represent their, their interests. And that's exactly what's happening. And he is, is um, to be applauded for saying that, given that he has uh, you know, served very senior roles as an official diplomat, but no doubt is also someone who's a private authority in his own right. Wherever he goes, whatever he says, people read as, an, as a statement of influence, as something that he intends to do. And whether or not he has the backing of a government is, is almost not as important. Uh, it's interesting because if, if you take your uh, conceptual framework and apply it to something like WikiLeaks, whether you approve it or not, I'm right. not addressing that question, then, then you, you can actually see it in a different light because what, what you're saying is secrecy and diplomacy conducted by states is a, is a phenomena that, uh, whose time has passed. We still need it, but, but the, the, the technology is changing the way information is stored, uh, dispersed, and it's, it's no longer possible to control that. And so it, 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 by, by understanding the new renaissance, right. you have a different reaction than if you're still in the medieval period of the Cold War. Well, you know, the, I think that, you know, again, technology is not eliminating diplomacy. secrecy and diplomacy among governments or among private actors and governments. We have diplomacy, we have secret diplomacy and secret dialogues all the time between our government and our corporations or other corporations. It's a, it's a very much a part uh, of the process. If you had a WikiLeaks dump of cables coming out of France or Japan, would the content be what the American WikiLeaks content was? No. Mm -hmm. The content of the American WikiLeaks cables was largely political commentary and observation about political elites and interlocutors. If this were a Japanese WikiLeaks dump, it mm -hmm. would all be corporate industrial espionage mm -hmm. because that's what their foreign policy is, is their commercial policy. The same is true of France. The same is true of Canada. The same is true of Britain. Uh, the same is true of Brazil. The same is true of uh, India. Some of the most important powers in the world much of their diplomacy is commercial. 
diplomacy. Uh, we are a bit of an outlier in that sense. We have lots of commercial diplomacy, but the government doesn't necessarily oversee it all, and the government doesn't always need to actively promote it the way those other countries do through their state-sponsored uh, sectors and in industrial support. So. You know, I don't see the state withering away. I don't see state diplomacy withering away. I don't see secrecy dying. I see them adapting in these many forms. I just see them being part of a much broader plurality. Mm -hmm. So, so in the light of your analysis, how do you think U.S. Uh, leaders uh, have to think when they're making and implementing foreign policy? That's a great question. That's something that I, I try and spend a lot of time on here. Um, to me, there's a three-step process that foreign policy making needs to go through in order to uh, you know, implement or think about, conceive of smart policy. The first is this whole of government approach that everyone talks about. All elements of national power, DOD, CIA, FBI, commerce, treasury, uh, energy, and so forth. We have 25, 30, 40 different uh, you know, agencies that, that have an impact abroad. Bring them together in the right combination, you know, mul multiplying those resources and coordinating them well is something we need to do a much, much better job of. We've been talking about it for years. We still don't do it very well, and Afghanistan is just a case in point, but there are many others. The second is this um, multi-partner approach, as Anne-Marie Slaughter, who was the head of the policy planning um, unit at State, called it. Uh, that meant looking at our allies. Where is the burden sharing? Where is the division of labor? And not just among allies. What is China's role? Who are they talking to? Where are they investing? What projects are they running? Who are their contacts and connections on the ground? Where is the, where is the sort of evaluation that pulls that together and says, we're not the only players there. Whatever the country is, whatever we do is not the only thing, we're not the only show in town anymore. The third thing is the public-private approach, right? The American footprint in the world is much larger than just the DOD and the State Department. The American footprint on the world is largely our corporations. It's our investments abroad, our trade abroad. It's our universities. It's our role in educating the world. It is our it is uh, remittances. America is the largest source of uh, remittance capital in the entire world. Um, it is so many of those things, which if you add them up, really represent America's footprint in the world. But Washington does neither captures that nor harnesses that nor even understands it yet. So those are the three steps that I think we need to go through if we want to have smart policy. Mm -hmm. uh, let, let's uh, look at this question of security. And in, in your book, you are proposing that uh, uh, we have to look at regional actors to provide re regional security. So, so let's take that notion and apply it to the Afghan war, the Afghan-Pakistan sure. uh, area, yeah. the area, the relationship with India and so on. Because yeah. really what, what you're suggesting, you're, you're suggesting two things when you talk about Afghanistan. One is this, this private-public partnership, but also a, re a regional solution oh, to, the, to the problem. Yeah, and I think this, the Afghanistan example really encapsulates the need to think not just about regional organizations, but also public-private diplomacy. But starting with the regionalism, this is an area that has no strong regional institutions. There is a vacuum between the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and its membership, meaning particularly the post-Soviet Turkic republics, and SARC, the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, which has, uh, you know, the, the South Asian countries, Pakistan, India, and so a very weak and effective organization. In between is this AFPAC Iranian conundrum. There is no regional governance mechanism there. There is no strong regional diplomacy there. It has been imposed or convened from the outside by our special envoys, uh, the late Richard Holbrook and, and others. So building something indigenous there is very important. Of course, this is something that we should have realized 10 years ago as we arrive at the 10th anniversary of 9-11 because Afghanistan is a landlocked country. We have to embed it in a regional economic and security framework. We have failed to do that. We are only now speaking about a Silk Road strategy for the region which, quite frankly, is something that you know uh, is germane to the region's history going back thousands of years and therefore should have served as an important underpinning for our strategy. And it's certainly something that, that I and others have been writing about for a long time. I think the, our government is behind the curve but finally catching up on that. Then the second angle is the public-private sort of thing. Let's just do a little thought experiment. I mean, Harry, how many, in what year would the Afghan government be a competent, sovereign uh, actor capable of providing public goods such as security and infrastructure and health and education to all of its citizens absent the role of private foreign actors in that country. 
The answer is yes, never, exactly, <laughs> right. right? Now, as uncoordinated and haphazard as the current landscape in the country is, and I'm no apologist for the, um, the, the unnecessary duplication of resources that many of these actors conduct, so let's just you know, put that aside. But the fact is that they're all there doing something, right? The literacy rate is what it is because of Oxfam, Save the Children, Care, and others, not because of the Afghan Education Ministry, right? The vaccination rate is improved not because of the Afghan Health Ministry, right, but because of NGOs that are working locally there. Um, you know, when roads are built, it's done by private companies and so forth. I'm not saying that we should be replacing the state. I'm saying that we have to move towards this governance structure in which there is a public role and a private role. I strongly advocate the role of public institutions as providing financing, providing risk guarantees, uh, and all of these types of things that governments can do and should do. Uh, in the in the region, but I'm not. But I don't believe that you can live in a world without those actors enhancing governance rather than than being a detriment. To it. So, what what is your explanation or place in your model for traditional groupings, uh, tribes, uh, uh, religious affiliation? One thinks here of uh, the Taliban, which at some level is doing. Uh, uh, is combining in its effort the, 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 uh, uh, the private public sector when, when it's doing things other than killing people and doing terrorism. Well, the Muslim Brotherhood, Hezbollah, the Taliban, yeah. and so forth. I mean, they're all quite unique, uh, but they are similar in that these are non-state, transnational groups and actors that provide a certain degree of security and welfare to their adherents and constituents. I think mm. that's a fairly technical way of understanding what they are. You can't wish them away. You can't delegitimize them just because you're not talking to them. The fact is they have a local legitimacy that's more important than whether or not the State Department is talking to them or not talking to them. But in any case, we are talking to them actually, uh, whether it's secret or in public. Um, that's already happening. Um, and I think so, therefore, they are important in the literal sense of being important empirically important uh, and we do have to negotiate with them we do have to understand how it is that they build their legitimacy what services they provide if you want to displace them you have to displace their service provision uh, they also may have a territorial role I look at again the stateless groups like Kurds and Palestinians and I'm quite pro self-determination also yeah. and the Pashtuns however the, the the spectrum that you have to consider is to what extent they actually have a coherent internal governance ambition uh, and and mechanism for channeling their 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 aspirations for independence into an actual, uh, you know, uh, uh, concrete governance uh, sort of uh, instrument. And the Pashtuns don't yet have that. They haven't devised, they have a tribal structure, of course, they have tribal relationships, but that doesn't mean that they have governance, the capacity for governance. They don't have that yet. You, you uh, I think, are saying again and again that what we have to do is support, find, and appreciate the mechanisms that uh, allow uh, global resources to uh, be applied effectively in local situations. Absolutely, yeah. To me, you know, the measure of a response to a uh, food crisis, right, such as we have had, uh, is not how much money was pledged to a global food security fund managed in New York at the United Nations, not even remotely, right? To me, that's the antithesis of progress. To me, progress in food security is how much investment was made in improving the productivity of local agriculture so that there is a resilience to the local food economy, improving supply chains so that food that is grown can actually sell in diverse markets if there's an oversupply. It is creating food stocks and reserves uh, at, at regional or local levels so that, again, if there is a food price spike, or at least this can mit mitigate price spikes, but also provide for people in those times of financial stress. All of those are local measures, national at best, right? They are not global. We overuse the word global, Harry. We abuse the word global. People use the word global to, to, to latch on to security and terrorism or to climate change because that gets you money, that gets you resources, that gets you attention. 99% of the terrorism in the world is local terrorism based on local political grievances. What are we doing talking about global jihad and global terrorism? Because 9-11 happened? Yes, it did, and it was tragic, and it was a major terrorist incident. But it is an outlier in terms of the fact that most terrorism is about Kashmir, about Pakistan, about Afghanistan, about Iraq, about Palestine, about Sri Lanka. That's what most terrorism is, is locally motivated. And we have to, if you want to actually eliminate global jihad or eliminate global terrorism, all these grand sounding terms that have dominated the discourse for the last decade, the answer is always local. Not sometimes local, always local. Mm -hmm. 
let, let's apply your analysis now to the revolutions in, in the Middle East, because it would seem to be a case where uh, uh, your, your concepts uh, help us a lot in understanding what's going on. Well, the first is this idea of post-colonial entropy, right? What's happening right now in the region is not just failed states or failing states. It's something much deeper. A failed state is the manifestation. It's the result. It's the end of a very long process. The deep trend is what I call this post-colonial entropy, the real dissipation and fragmentation of many of these countries that began with their, with their independence uh, three generations ago. So that is, is one way in which you need to understand, I think, what's happening today. The second is not to be wedded to the current cartography of the region. If Libya splits, so be it. You have to understand just how artificial a construction Libya is, and that applies to other countries in the region as well. Kurdistan and Iraq, similar outcome to me. Uh, so not to be wedded to arbitrary post-colonial borders is the second lesson. The third is, of course, the importance of regional organizations. The fact that the Arab League endorsed and was part of the deliberations over what to do um, in Libya is extremely important. So regional organizations stepping up and, and actually determining what their future is going to be within their, their zone or sphere, and the African Union is, is similarly important in that regard. Another way in which I think the, this public-private framework is born is what do you do next, really, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you know, um, if you want to help Egypt, it's not just about a bilateral dialogue with the military about democratization. It's very important. But Egypt has four sectors into its economy. The Suez Canal fees, natural gas, uh, textiles, and tourism. All of those are broken or hurt, other than the canal. Uh, that requires foreign investment. How do you enable, empower, incentivize corporations, uh, entrepreneurs to move into that space and improve that infrastructure and build, uh, physically construct a future economy for the country? That's not something that having lots of meetings uh, at the State Department is going to solve. And so there's a whole set of public-private dialogues that need to take place in order to rehabilitate the country that is the most populous uh, Arab nation. Mm -hmm. so, so we should not be looking for U.S. aid or a, uh, a, a UN uh, uh, agency supporting uh, 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 the future of Egypt, but really what Egyptian entrepreneurs working, hypothetically, right. working with American well, entrepreneurs. It's, it's not either or. It's yeah. both and. USAID has done things in Egypt that no Egyptian, uh, or at least no Egyptian who's interviewed by Western media uh, would appreciate, such as refurbishing the sewer system of one of, one of the world's teeming megacities. That's pretty damn important. Mm -hmm. I'm very glad that USAID did that. But at the same time, United States aid as, as a package to Egypt has obviously largely supported the military rule uh, of the country. That has clearly not been such a good thing. What we need to be doing is enabling entrepreneurship, so supporting local actors through a seed fund. OPIC, for example, the overseas private investment company, an arm of the U.S. government, has pledged $2 billion in investment guarantees. That means American companies can move in and build factories and hire locals and train them and improve management, all of these things. Um, and that's something that the government is facilitating and enabling. So public, private, both and, not either or. Just look at one other thing, education, which I should have mentioned earlier. American universities have, um, since the 19th century, we've had the American University of Cairo, American University of Beirut. Look at the last 10 years. 30, 40 American universities have set up campuses in the heart of the Middle East at the peak of anti-American sentiment and antipathy towards American foreign policy. But people want American education, and it's having a tangible impact on local values, women's rights, governance, accountability, these kinds of things. And it's been done by private actors, by our universities. Again, another example of, uh, of the need for public-private collaboration. What is the best way to channel and prepare students to channel uh, I, their idealism to to achieve uh, effective results in in this world that you're describing. Well, I mean, the first is to be consider yourself a diplomat based on the cause that you represent, not who you work for. Right? If you work for the Gates Foundation, you are a health diplomat. You are nothing less than that. You are no lesser a diplomat than someone who works for the Center for Disease Control or USAID. 
right? If you work for Oxfam, you're a development diplomat. If you work, in fact, in an investment bank that actually provides um, capital for, for retail banks in emerging markets, you're actually a very important financial diplomat. You are creating the conditions for there to be local entrepreneurship and growth by way of your capital investments. That's very important stuff that's going on. That's all diplomacy as well. So I think first is understanding that you don't need to t fit yourself into some narrow pyramid that says, I need to move to Washington and I need to tick some boxes and I need to stamp some passports for a few years in order to gain credibility as a diplomat. You don't need to do any such thing. You can go channel your idealism tomorrow, right, by joining one of these organizations, public or private, right? It doesn't have to be an NGO. It can be any number of things. Um, and certainly, you know, again, there are all of these intangible ways in which American students actually uh, have this positive footprint or impact in the world that don't get captured by, by, uh, by foreign public opinion surveys. You know, business school students across America pro bono help put together business plans for struggling entrepreneurs using Skype and Kiva um, uh, than, than we really have ever bothered to quantify. This is a free service that they do just to build credibility, to learn what local entrepreneurship is like, to help other people, a variety of motivations. Uh, you know, there's traditional instruments like the Peace Corps. Go join the Peace Corps. People say it's the, those are the best ambassadors we've ever had, right? So there, there are so many things that I encourage young people to do. The first is certainly to travel abroad. Uh, and then uh, finally, what do you see as the, the major one or two obstacles to uh, moving forward uh, to this new renaissance? The first would obviously be inertia, right? I mean, in just the way in which we think. The notion that government or international organizations are the de facto authorities and the legitimate authorities uh, to implement what is a global sort of public agenda and global goals. That's just simply not true. Uh, we are in a much more diffuse and chaotic landscape in which basically uh, everyone who has the capacity and the resources needs to step up and do something and do it either individually or through coalition. So the inertia, which is a, a nice way of saying laziness, really, is, is a huge problem. And the lack of education, of course, as well. So I think those are the kinds of things that we need to overcome if we're going to move towards a new, a new renaissance. And we need to harness the new technologies that make it possible to get us there. Mm -hmm. Let me show our audience your book again, How to Run the World. Uh, and uh, thank you for writing it and, and thank you for coming on our program. Thank you, Harry. Great it was a fascinating discussion. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.